Hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to spend 30 to 40 minutes with us discussing the merits of direct georeferencing and how they might apply to your airborne survey collection requirements. I am Michael Sitar of Regal USA, and I'll be hosting this joint webinar with Aplanix, a Trimble company. With me today is Mr. Eric Liberty, Director of Sales at Aplanix. Eric is responsible for leading the Aplanix sales team in providing exceptional business to customer communication and sales services. Eric is also responsible for the overall strategic sales plan for kinematic mapping and positioning systems. He holds an MBA from the University of Toronto and joined the Planix in October of 2006 as DSS product manager for their imaging solutions business. Welcome, Eric. Hey, thanks very much, Mike, and I welcome everyone who's online. Looking forward to presenting the information that we have alongside of Regal and uh, look forward to some engaging conversation coming out of our presentation. Great. Today we'll explore a high-performance direct georeferencing system and its importance to laser-based scanning systems. We'll discuss the definition of direct georeferencing, some advantages and disadvantages, challenges as they relate to high-accuracy LiDAR mapping, and this, this brief discussion on Regal Airborne Sensors and the Planix Position Orientation Systems. We'll learn what additional value-added capabilities in a Planix DG solution offers specifically Aplanix's portfolio and how they interface with the Regal Airborne solutions. We'll have a brief discussion on the embedded OEM product solutions that are powered by Trimble GNSS receivers and various calibration methodologies. And then finally, DG post-processing methodologies for varying operational collection, timeline and accuracy requirements. And Eric will discuss this in more detail looking at a couple of different methodologies, and then finally wrapping up with our, uh, their software, POSPAC MMS and POSPAC UAV. So before we get started, let's run through a couple polls. All right, so to start, let's select a poll here. So the first poll is, how dependent are your missions on using dedicated ground control for data collection? Over 50% of the time, 100% of missions using some sort of ground control, or ground control rarely used in missions. So you can see here the uh, results of the poll. It's, it's kind of spread throughout. It's interesting to see the results actually, but uh, the highest percentage being 100% of missions are using some sort of ground control. And as I was stating, you know, with the Planix, our, our, our business is based on direct georeferencing. And though that, um, you know, it, a lot of the presentations that we give cite the fact that we're looking to eliminate a lot of that ground control, and I use the word a lot, it's not elim eliminating ground control altogether. It's limiting the use of ground control or using different methods of post-processing so that you can optimize the accuracy out of the mapping payload that you have. So this was an interesting result to see where I was expecting actually to see over 50%, uh, the 50% bar to be higher, but to see it, uh, to see 100% of missions using some sort of ground control, that's very interesting. So, so um, and, and a second part to that question is 25% um, of the respondents are saying that they're rarely using ground control. Can you explain that? Yeah, I um, and this may be a function of some of the post-processing methodologies that I'm going to go over later on in the presentation, or it could be that a lot of these users are operating in remote locations or rapid response applications where there's just no option to have any ground control on the ground. Uh, so it's, um, it, again, very interesting to see the results of the poll and hopefully the information throughout the presentation will kind of build on that and describe to users how they can optimize their accuracy not having any ground control. Interesting. Okay, so let's do one more poll. What is your most important consideration in choice of a DG system for airborne mapping? Is it accuracy, speed of collection and processing? cost of the sensor or a combination thereof? And uh, I'm hoping some of the users out there are going to, uh, obviously this is valuable information to both of our organizations, to Regal and Aplanix. Um, the importance here, obviously as the cost of sensors come down and, uh, and more users are investigating the use of these sensors on their mapping payloads, you know, there you have it, uh, accuracy being 90%. And that's that's really what I expected to see. And, 
you know, there's there's a, a link between the accuracy and the cost of the sensors as well, depending on how these sensors are manufactured. So whether they be MEMS, fiber optic gyros, or uh, or some other technology used inside the IMU, and certainly the uh, the pause system itself. So it's interesting to see the accuracy uh, being the highest uh, consideration there. Um, of course, that's a function of how much a user is willing to pay to get that accuracy. So interesting result. Definitely. All right. Okay. So moving along. What is direct georeferencing? Well, direct georeferencing is the determination of an accurate point or location on the Earth using integrated inertial GPS technology to directly compute the position and orientation of the airborne sensor with respect to the local mapping frame. This hardware and software solution comprises of several enabling technologies that form the basis of an inertial navigation solution to calculate altitude, attitude, angular rate, linear velocity, and absolute position within a global reference frame. The INS solution includes an inertial measurement unit, which is an electronic device that measures and records a sensor or platform's change in orientation. Example, roll, pitch, and heading relative to the Earth's center. To do so, it uses a combination of accelerometers and gyroscopes to measure linear acceleration and rotational rate. It also includes a dual frequency GNSS receiver with access to a number of global positioning satellites and frequencies to accurately triangulate a position. The core enabler of the DG solution is a common filter and according to Wikipedia, uses a systems dynamic model for physical laws of motion. Known control inputs to that system and multiple sequential measurements such as from sensors themselves form an estimate of the system state and that is better that is better than the estimate obtained by using only one measurement or sensor alone. As such, it is a common sensor fusion and data fusion algorithm. In other words, the noisy data inputs of individual sensors can be better predicted when combined by other variables. For example, a low noise IMU can help solve for the position variability of GNSS observations and provide a much better prediction of the action sensor platform position. And finally, a post-processing workflow that allows a refined determination of contributing errors, such as receiver clock errors and precise ephemeris data to maximize data accuracy for survey grade applications. When considering the independent sensors, a GNSS only solution will provide adequate positioning accuracy and for many applications until it is challenged by way of horizon shadowing causing impaired signal reception and signal dropouts. This is particularly true in urban canyons or obscured antennas on platform installations. An inertial only solution provides a six degree freedom of solution with no dropouts, but it can be difficult to independently deconvolve the accumulated errors. By combining GNSS and inertial technologies, these weaknesses are typically overcome. And this is particularly the case with tightly integrated solutions, whereby the high sampling rates of the of the IMU can overcome the brief GPS outages should they occur. So DG solutions have really become the norm for the fast and accurate collection of platform and sensor orientation and position information compared to traditional aerial triangulation methods. Unlike traditional aerial triangulation methods though, DG does not depend on the use of ground control points to determine the platform's position and orientation. The advantage of this is that surveyors can produce highly accurate map products in remote areas or hostile environments where deploying ground control is not possible. And this translates to a less labor intensive effort and ultimately faster results. On the disadvantages side of the equation uh, is that individual sun sensors can suffer from accumulated air if they're not dynamically corrected at a regular interval. Other factors can include improperly determined calibration values, such as sensor misalignment relative to the platform, sensor susceptibility to electronic interference, and of course, environmental sensitivity, such as changes in temperature and pressure. DG can be done in real time and in post-processing, depending on accuracy requirements and the speed of which data is required. For rapid response applications, RTK provides a level of accuracy that may be suitable for in-situ decision support systems, 
but may not require absolute accuracies to be effective. For maximum accuracy, however, as we know, a post-processing solution is preferred. Now, Regal has worked very closely with the Planix to develop advanced DG solutions for all our kinematic mapping products, most recently for our UAV LiDAR mapping payloads. While our emphasis has been on the design, manufacture, and support of high-precision LiDAR instrumentation, we rely on the Planix for the continuous development of high-accuracy DG solutions to enable high-accuracy data deliverables with low measurement noise for engineering survey applications. The development of the APX15L single board GNSS inertial hardware module has been instrumental in Regal's UAS sensor payloads on group one and group two UAVs. The scalability of the board set to include high accuracy IMUs meshes extremely well with our longer range performance sensors. Finally, the development of a more cost-effective and UAB-specific post-processing package has allowed Regal to become a leading supplier of high-accuracy, high-precision UAV payloads. And Eric will go into more detail on POSPAC UAV shortly. There's a misnomer in the industry that Aplanix is an IMU manufacturer. In fact, Aplanix not only develops their own IMU technologies, but also works very closely with other IMU manufacturers to develop unique and proprietary inertial components for high accuracy applications. IMUs are tested and calibrated to optimize them for use in kinematic mapping. A proprietary calibration process called Aplanix SmartCal is used to characterize and classify the performance of all Aplanix IMUs prior to being assigned to an accuracy product group. So why do Regal LiDAR systems demand high accuracy direct georeferencing systems? Well, unlike a continuous image, LiDAR data consists of discrete continuous points, discontinuous points of which a control target may or may not be observable. This is part partly due to the fact that linear mode LiDAR systems typically employ a beam collimator. This means that the emitted beam footprint increases with altitude. Since beam footprint is an important consideration with respect to required point density to effectively detect control points, control point size should also be considered based on platform height above ground and the required point density to be able to resolve them sufficiently. Therefore, it is far more efficient to employ a DG solution such that GCPs are used to verify accuracy adherence as opposed to determining core orientation parameters. Similarly, a single wavelength sensor inhibits visual identification if there is no elevational 3D component to the GCP. Again, a traditional AT approach with ground targets is not necessarily conducive to efficient LiDAR data collection and processing. The scan FOV of a LiDAR sensor and related area coverage rate is often much narrower than the traditional wide format imagery. The number of control points required to implement AT with LiDAR would be too labor intensive to be considered practical. IMUs capture angular orientation data. Therefore, as distance or height above ground increases, any errors in the angular measurements translate to larger physical offsets on the ground. Therefore, generally speaking, higher accuracy DG solutions are required for higher altitude sensors and lower accuracy DG solutions are acceptable for lower altitude sensors. However, a limitation of DG solutions has to do with angular drift over time. Without platform dynamics, the IMU measurement accuracies can start to drift. Therefore, for long flight line survey blocks, the heading drift rate becomes critically important. For this reason, low altitude corridor solutions that might otherwise be okay with a lower accuracy IMU may require a higher accuracy IMU to maintain overall solution accuracies if long transmission line corridors are required to be collected. Why a Planix position orientation systems? Well, Aplanix offers a suite of DG solutions that allow us to pair the ideal solution for the desired sensor and application. Whether it is high accuracy solutions for wide area and long corridor applications, or lower accuracy solutions for UAV sensor payloads, Aplanix is our sole provider for DG solutions for our entire kinematic product portfolio. The DG solutions are also scalable to enable future accuracy upgrades, as well as available with ITAR free components for ease of import, export, for those interested in performing international projects. A significant advantage of our Aplanix relationship has been our OEM component business expansion. 
This aspect enables not only a more solutions-oriented sensor configuration, but it also enables a superior and reliable product implementation. While Regal sensors are available as LiDAR transceivers, allowing users to integrate their own choice of third-party DG solutions, the compact and tightly integrated approach of an OEM solution simplifies the sensor configuration and streamlines the production workflow. Being a member of the Trimble family of companies, many of the Trimble tool sets are available to Planex to broaden their value added functionality and provide clients with a range of processing approaches based on application requirements. And finally, product support is crucial to minimizing downtime and keeping sensors airborne. Regal and Planex work hand in hand to ensure issues are quickly and expediently resolved. So what Aplanix DG solutions are typically paired with Regal products? Well, for wide area mapping and long flight line applications, Regal integrates Aplanix's AP60 DG system. The AP60 consists of an enhanced inertial navigator that combines a powerful Trimble GNSS receiver and fiber optic gyro inertial measurement unit. This maximum performance IMU is custom made for kinematic mapping applications. It's calibrated by Aplanix using their smart cal process to achieve superior performance. And if you look at the actual values, the RMS values in degrees of the rule pitch and heading, um, we can see that they're uh, uh, 0.0025 degrees versus 0.005. So very tight accuracies um, and uh, heading um, uh, values that allow us to do long flight lines and maintain that heading accuracy over time. For small to mid-area mapping, Regal offers not only the AP60, but also the AP50. And the AP50 includes the same enhanced inertial navigator and Trimble GNSS receiver, but this time combines a smaller, slightly less accurate inertial measurement unit. This medium performance IMU is ideal for these lower to mid-altitude sensor applications. Uh, there, it's also custom made for kinematic mapping. It's calibrated again using the SmartCal process. And in terms of the comparative uh, RMS capabilities and accuracy, it, you can see here it's about half that of the AP60 at 005 and, and 010 for heading. For low altitude applications, Regal offers the AP20. The AP20 includes the same IMU as that of the AP50, but is of a slow, slightly lower accuracy still. Again, it includes the enhanced um, inertial navigator and GNSS receiver. And this lower performance IMU provides centimeter accuracy for low altitude applications. And finally, again, it also utilizes the smart cal process to categorize the accuracy of the sensor. And in here you can see that the, uh, the RMS residual values in the accuracy for rule pitch and heading are lesser still than the AP50. On this slide, what we're looking at is a couple of, of the installations of the Regal sensors uh, with the uh, IMU or the DG solutions offered by Planix. On the left is our uh, premium wide area mapping sensor, the VQ1560 Mark IIs. And because of the long range performance of this sensor, we're really incorporating uh, Planix's highest accuracy system, the, the AP60. Um, what you can't see here is the IMU is actually um, housed within the sensor housing. Uh, on the optical chassis to provide maximum stability and, and alignment. In the middle photograph, what you see is, is the same IMU, except this time bolted externally on the top of our VQ480 or 580 Mark II sensor. Um, this sensor has very narrow sides. It allows you to drop in between the seat rails, um, or um, it can actually be fit directly into a GSM mount and cameras attached on either side. So. Uh, all of these solutions are in fact able to be gyro stabilized. And then finally, on the far right, typical of uh, corridor type applications where the altitudes are generally lower, our AP20s is often a popular product and here it's mounted on a platform within the sensor pod with one of our smaller scanners. And for those that are doing extremely long transmission corridor, corridor collections, um, there's an option to upgrade this to the AP60 and this is available for fitment in our new VPX one pod. Now bolting on an IMU is a straightforward procedure, but maximum data accuracy requires a very accurate determination of IMU misalignment angles to ensure that accuracy is translated into the resultant data. 
This is done by first conducting a bore site to determine the exterior orientation values as they relate to the misalignment of the IMU to the LiDAR perspective center. To do so, a bore site flight is flown over a control field that includes opposing flight lines of varying altitudes. This calibration flight data is then processed within our RIDE process software platform via the RIDE precision tool set to determine the misalignment correction angles. This is automatically determined using rigorous least squares methods in the new values formatted as a sensor definition file for import to RIDE acquire for in-air data accuracy, but also RIDE process for output data accuracy. In terms of generating an accurate trajectory from the collected GNSS and IMU data during flight, Aplanix has developed a software package called POSPAC MMS. The trajectory generated within POSPAC MMS is ingested in Regal's RIE Process Kinematic LiDAR Processing Suite to geolocate the LiDAR point data. Other capabilities of the Regal RIE Process software suite include XYZ point computation, of course, via the co-process trajectory file, there is the camera processing engine. In, um, native to the RIE process suite is a 2D and 3D visualization engine. There is a scan adjustment engine, which I just mentioned earlier, called RIE Precision. And finally, there's, of course, RGB point coloration from the imagery that's imported to the software. And there is the ability to do LiDAR point editing and classification. So at this point in my presentation, um, I'm going to pass over the the, the uh, controls over to Eric, and he's going to explain in more detail some of the aspects of Aplanix's DG solutions. Okay, thanks, Mike. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen there. It's always a bit of a challenge when we get into handing off presentations, but I'm hopeful that... Uh, Everybody's got a good view of what's going on here in the presentation. So I just wanted to circle back. And, and, one, and one thing I wanted to do was echo Mike's uh, opening comments and his introduction and just cite that the fact that it's a pleasure today to be presenting alongside Mike and Regal and the benefits of our integrated products into uh, Regal's platforms. We've got over a 15-year uh, history of working with Regal, and we certainly value them as a partner, not only in the use of products that are integrated, into their sensors, but also the development of our own next generation platforms. So both organizations have a long legacy and professional rapport in the, in, in the industry. Our products uh, work and are supported second to none in the geospatial industry. One of the things I wanted to clarify just before I launch into post-processing methodologies is the distinction between AP product and APX product. It's one, uh, one item of clarification that I, uh, I often do in presentations. So with the AP product, these are OEM level products that are embedded primarily in the manned aircraft or piloted aircraft. In the case of APX product, those are products, again, OEM products are embedded in the mapping payloads on, um, on UAV platforms. So there's a distinction between the two. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that uh, before we get too far into uh, into post-processing. So uh, what I wanted to do was just go over as an extension of what Mike has uh, introduced here as far as uh, POSPAC MMS um, and, and give you a quick rundown on some of the options that are available uh, uh, in addition to just the base uh, post-processing software itself. So POSPAC is a unique uh, processing suite for Planix DG systems and it's common across all of our business segments, that's land, air, and marine. So it's the same processing suite used throughout. Uh, the software was designed to efficiently allow users to combine their GNSS data with their inertial data to provide that blended solution, that accurate blended solution and robust positioning in uh, GNSS challenge conditions. So POSPAC, again, works in sync with a Planix uh, direct georeferencing sensors to provide the positioning data for mobile mapping platforms, including obviously the Regal uh, LiDAR uh, uh, portfolio of sensors. Um, it includes quality control and pre-mission uh, field quality control, allowing users to reduce their uh, rework and deployment costs.
Okay, POSPAC, I, now I'll, I'll get into some of the additions on top of POSPAC that we've recently introduced. So uh, our, our most current version of POSPAC is POSPAC 8. And uh, there's a few ad additions to POSPAC 8 that will make users a lot more efficient in the way they're post-processing. So POSPAC 8 now includes the ability to post-process uh, using Trimble's Centerpoint RTX. And this is commonly known as uh, PPRTX or post-process RTX. So users now can achieve centimeter, centimeter level accuracy within minutes after data collection uh, with just an internet connection. So there's no need to wait for that public domain uh, data. Uh, and this, this in itself provides immense uh, proficiency gains or pro productivity gains. So as long as, um, you know, this is, this is a big advantage where you're mapping inaccessible regions that have no core data, or no localized base stations where you can now take the PPRTX and process within a, a suite. And I'll go over that a little bit more in the presentation uh, as we move along here. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, we have our smart base uh, uh, input as well. So I'll go over that methodology of post-processing as well. But the, post, the, the, the base post-processing software is known as POSPAC MMS, and then users have the ability to add on to that. And these are the, uh, the methodologies that I'm gonna go over as we move through the presentation. Okay. Okay, so three methodologies. Um, First one being single base uh, station processing. Then we have post-process VRS with the Planix Smart Base, and then we have uh, PPRTX that I'll go over. So these these different methods use uh, different different methods of augmentation uh, that are used with the Planix positioning systems in combination with the post-processing uh, methodologies that allow users to remain flexible in the choice of generating data depending on the operational conditions that they are operating within. So each data collection mission will involve different operating criteria and accuracy demands. I'm sure those of you in, in practice know this. Uh, it's a big it's a big consideration before you fire up the aircraft and go out and collect your airborne mapping data. But having the ability, the flexibility of choosing different methods of processing the data allows for efficiency gains and cost savings. So these are the, the three I wanted to go over today. And as we move through, you'll see how these efficiency gains will benefit you as a user. So the single base station, what is it? Uh, well, it's the use of a dedicated ground reference station, uh, and and it's still common in practice today. The use of GNSS uh, of a of a GNSS reference station, and and you can see an example of one on this slide, um, uh, is is commonly located within a certain uh, vicinity of where the rover is operating. Uh, this could be a core station, a continuously uh, op op operating receiver in the field, or it can be a, a receiver that you, you would set up as a, a practitioner. And then, and then in turn, those raw observables get downloaded so that you can use those in post-processing. So the core single base station, what is it? Well, this is uh, the use of, of a continuously operating reference station. And this in itself, planning needs to go into whether or not the, the mission location has adequate coverage. You can see some of that coverage on this map here in, uh, in North America. And typically, this, you would need a station that's located within 30 kilometers of aircraft operation. Once the station is chosen, then the raw data observables can get logged from the web and available typically next day for data processing in the mission area. Um, this is an example of a product that Aplanix brought out when we launched our UAV portfolio. And we launched this product uh, simply because in a lot of cases, you're operating in an area, remote areas, where there isn't adequate coverage. The smart target uh, or base station allows for uh, a low cost survey grade base station be located within the mission area. You simply place it in the flight area and start collection uh, using uh, an Android app on your phone or tablet. You fly the mission and then the data then gets, uh, the coordinates get automatically surveyed in by POSPAC. And then the, the target itself can be also be used for some of the image processing 
from a camera. So it's a great option to have in those kinds of areas where you don't have adequate coverage, you need a ground-based station, but you also need a target. So a good example of that is in a corridor application where you're flying long lines and you don't have the ability to have adequate coverage of the, the dedicated stations on the ground where you can locate a few of these along the line and then have a, uh, a good coverage as far as ground control goes. So how does that single uh, base station work? Well, it's again, placed within the mission area. The raw observables are logged and uh, typically that's about a 30 minute wait time. And at that point, those raw observables are logged and used for the data processing within POSPAC. And a lot of you that are already using the software today and certainly POS systems know exactly what this procedure is. So the typical use cases for this single base station, again, UAV surveys or smaller mapping uh, projects, you're gonna get centimeter level accuracy. The limitations are you have to have that dedicated station located within a certain, a certain uh, baseline separation from where your rover's operating. We, we recommend at least 30 kilometers. And then uh, you might end up in an area where there's no core coverage. Um, so there are some limitations to that single base station. The obvious limitation is, you know, having to set it up and deploy somebody in the field to put that to put that dedicated station in the field. Um, so what I wanted to do now was go over some options that are available within POSPAC that kind of that kind of eliminate the need to do some of this. One of those options, and and this is the uh, the second methodology of post processing I wanted to go through, is uh, Planix Smart Base. So this is a method of, uh, the, so it's a method uh, using the Aplanix VRS virtual reference station using smart, uh, using smart base. And it's one that's being adopted by many users today because of the remoteness of where they're operating and, and not having ad adequate coverage. So this process involves creating a single GNSS virtual reference station using a gridded network of existing physical stations around your mission area. The great thing about it is you don't, you can have, it's not limited to, to baseline. So you can have very long baselines on where those are located, as long as you have a gridded network and ad adequate coverage around your rover operation. And that can be well beyond that 30 kilometers that we, we cited earlier. What you're doing is you're taking those reference stations and gridding a network around your rover. And these, these stations can be either run by private companies or, or core stations, whatever, whatever the choice is. So they can be ingested into pause packs so long as, as you have uh, smart base enabled. So again, typical use of smart base are in, in smaller areas or, or larger mapping projects. Centimeter, again, centimeter level accuracy with no baseline dependency. That, that is one of the big advantages of uh, a smart base, but again, you're cutting down your costs and uh, and your deployment costs in, in not having to set up a physical uh, dedicated base station. Okay, but the limitation obviously is you you have to there has to be coverage around where you're operating to be able to uh, to grid that network. And if you're using cores uh, core stations, you have to wait for that data to become available, and that typically is about a day uh, before you're able to post process. Okay, the last one I wanted to go through is uh, is Trimble uh, Centerpoint RTX or Post Process RTX. Um, again, this is a dedicated network uh, that's a dedicated Trimble network of stations, uh, reference stations that that track different GPS constellations. You can see GPS, GLONASS, BDS, Q, QZSS, and uh, and Galileo. So we the great thing about this is you're not having to wait that long time, that that day, to get the data and be able to post-process. Uh, this this data is readily available. It's based in the real-time computation. So once that data becomes available, you're logging it. You're able to go ahead and post-process, uh, and it's an it's enabling accuracy approaching RTK without having those local reference stations, those dedicated local reference stations. You can see here the process of ingesting the data. So the trajectory information goes into an RTX server, and then it's it's basically 
taking that trajectory information, sending it up into the cloud. Uh, the corrections are made in the cloud and then they're in turn sent down so that uh, within, uh, within processing, then you can combine those with your IMU data and produce your SBET or smooth best estimated trajectory coming out of there. So, so it's a great option again for users to have because it's it's eliminating a lot of that um, that post processing or wait time that they have in their base um, in their base station information and making it readily available so that they can get to post processing within pause pack immediately. So the typical use of, of this methodology is again, corridor mapping, large mapping projects in remote areas where the, you have difficult terrain, you may not have access to these dedicated uh, base stations. Um, again, centimeter accuracy, there's no need to set up that physical base station and no baseline restriction. And the, the, big, the most important benefit there is the data is available immediately. There's no wait time. Uh, in the case of uh, what you're doing with the core station, okay. One of the other uh, options that we launched when we did launch our UAV portfolio is POSPAC UAV. Um, this is a, a uh, version of POSPAC that was launched specifically for our UAV portfolio. It combines uh, everything that that it's, it's single base, uh, single base differential GNSS processing. So that's the limitation of it there in, in, um, in comparison to what POSPAC MMS is. Uh, but it combines all of the efficiencies that we have in POSPAC like infusion. Uh, it's, it's fully supportive of uh, UAV dynamic models. It's a node lock software license. And um, it's it, again, an, a smart base is enabled. And it's purchased, so the, that smart base, uh, much like POSPAC uh, MMS is, is purchased separately. Um, and then you can take, so in combination with our APX product portfolio, every, pretty much every APX system we sell is also sold with a POSPAC UAV license for post-processing UAV data, uh, positioning data. But that license, that POSPAC UAV license is fully upgradable to a, uh, a POSPAC MMS license if a user needs to do that. And you can see, how does it work here? Well, much like POSPAC uh, MMS and our DG systems, you're taking the, the base station data, uh, the raw GNSS data, it's ingested, it's combined in POSPAC with the UAV data, and then output into a, an SBET, smooth best estimated trajectory solution. And, you're also getting exterior orientation if you're using a camera. So this is this is very important as you're moving through what type of data you're going to output out of the system. So the key benefits of POSPAC UAV, well, you're achieving that, uh, that and I, I hazard to call it survey precision, but you're, you're achieving very accurate mapping data with minimal uh, ground control. Uh, you're maximizing your productivity. Obviously, uh, a big consideration in the operation of UAVs is they go up in the air, they fly very short for a very short period of time, most of them, and you're having to get that data back on the ground and processed as quickly as you can. That's the advantage of POSPAC UAV in itself right there. And, you know, in combination with LIDARs and cameras on these UAVs now, that positioning data is critical to producing accurate map products and typically within uh, minutes of collecting uh, a mission. Now, this again is important because most UAV missions uh, that, that we've encountered, at least with users, typically are going to be rapid response missions where the UAV will go up and need to have that data on the ground as quickly as possible and post-process. So that's the advantage of using POSPAC UAV. So that's what I had as far as uh, post-processing methodologies. Now, I just wanted to conclude with a few statements here. Um, so obviously, Aplanix provides a portfolio of positioning solutions from entry level all the way up to very uh, accurate uh, uh, positioning systems for high altitude mapping payloads. Um, the one thing that, that uh, Mike touched on earlier on in the presentation, and I want to stress, is the fact that every one of our platforms or sensors is, is um, 
free from export control. So these, these systems can move around the world freely without there being a concern of having to affli- apply for uh, export control. That's a very important consideration, especially in the case where you need systems repaired, you need them supported. I mean, for the practitioners out there, for our customers, you know these systems don't break in a box getting ready to be put on the airplane. They'll break in the middle of a job and you need a company that's behind the product to be able to support it in field and have you up and operational as quickly as possible. And that is one of the things that we stress within a Planex is we have probably the the most world renowned, uh, highly respected support team out there for being able to get you up and operational as quickly as possible. Now our products are a combination of both and and, uh, we call them strap down solutions or, or, Uh, plug-and-play solutions as opposed to our OEM components uh, which are bought by OEMs and and cabled themselves and integrated themselves into their own platforms much like what Regal does with their uh, with their LiDAR uh, mapping payloads. We also leverage as I had mentioned in the presentation different tool sets which are in addition to our base POSPAC MMS uh, post-processing software, Trimble BRS, the CenterPoint, RTX. We have, uh, you know, we have the Smart Target in the case of UAV in most cases, uh, and then we have uh, Smart Base. So all of those, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to keep in mind as you investigate and pursue different different means of uh, not only collecting the data but processing the data. And then because of the uh, the variable portfolio that we have of sensors, it enables users to choose the best option that they need for accuracy on their LiDAR. So not every LiDAR system is going to require that highest level of accuracy, but you certainly want repeatable accuracy, reliable accuracy as you're collecting that mapping data. And that's exactly what Aplanix does with both its AP solutions and its uh, standalone solutions. We hang our hat on our spec, and and we make sure that we're not um, we're, we're not publishing a spec that's outside of what we can do. So um, and and it's one of the reasons why we've worked really well and closely with Regal over time to be able to uh, to enhance their own uh, lidar portfolio. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Mike. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's great to see so many hardware and processing options available for surveyors, especially based on their accuracy ac- ap- and application and logistical requirements. Uh, you, you know how it is, all, all these things. Everybody has a different need, um, a different application space. Um, so it's good to have all these different options, especially when it comes to the processing side of things. Now, before we before we end, I just want to go through a few of the questions um, that some of our uh, listeners have responded with. Um, the first one is, the AP20 uses the same INU as the AP50. That's what was mentioned earlier in the presentation. How is the better accuracy achieved with the AP50 then, when in fact it's the same INU? Yeah, so that's a great question. So with with the IMUs themselves, I mean, I, I hazard to say they're the same IMU. The, the IMUs will go through different calibration. They'll go through different software parameters, firmware parameters that are loaded on top of the IMU themselves to enhance how they perform. Um, and I, I'm probably the last guy to talk about it as far as the math uh, that goes behind how these sensors are calibrated even though they're the same footprint of IMU, they're not necessarily the same IMU. They may use the same technology, fiber optic gyros inside, but how they're calibrated and how they're tweaked and and the firmware that's loaded on them will dictate the performance level of the IMU. I hope that answers uh, the question. I think it does. Uh, yeah. it's good, 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 that's good to know. Um, now, Aplanix recently launched a new product portfolio uh, the AP Plus products for airborne OEMs, um, and, and I know we are we're yet to implement them ourselves. But can you describe uh, what uh, the future is with respect to the differences of the AP and the AP Plus? Yeah, you know, as far as the planets goes, we're really excited about this. It's going it's a it's a game changer for us in our OEM level products. So the AP Plus, uh, in comparison to AP. Um, it's it's all new hardware and software platform for direct georeferencing, specifically for mobile mapping. Um, the key features of it, the fact, and you can read about this on our website, but I'll, I'll kind of regurgitate what what's said there. Uh, it's 54% smaller footprint, 
64% lighter and 75% less power. I mean, for a lot of users out there, that's a game changer, and those are game changers in itself. Because when you're when you're building these mapping payloads, obviously smaller, lighter, less power. Those are all important considerations when you're when you're uh, when you're building these, uh, uh, you know, lidar camera payloads to go on either UAVs or manned platforms. Um, it also you the AP Plus will also use the next generation of uh, survey grade GNSS receiver put out by Trimble. And you can read about the specs on our website. Um, one of the other things uh, which AP doesn't have, which which uh, AP Plus will have, is the dual inertial support. Being able to so every one of the AP Plus products will be able to log external data in addition to having uh, an onboard uh, IMU uh, or inertial component on the board itself. It also has two antenna support. You know, not so prominent in the airborne side, more prominent on the land side, but in some airborne applications like UAV, where you're operating rover air or a rotor aircraft, uh, in hovering applications to improve the heading accuracy, you may have a dual antenna configuration. So the, the AP Plus will enable you to have that right on the board itself. And it also embeds next generation infusion uh, aided inertial firmware, and it's fully configurable. So the great thing is we're going to have the same base hardware across all of our business segments, air, land, and marine, for use throughout, so that if a user needs to configure it differently, uh, depending on the rover it's operating, a user can do that. So small, but the, but the, the big importance there is smaller, lighter, less power. This is, this is making things much more efficient for users to use. Interesting. Um, another question: If POSPAC MMS and, and POSPAC UAV are so similar, what is the functionality difference, and what's the cost difference? Yeah, I mean the that another great question. So POSPAC MMS versus po, we used to call POSPAC UAV or POSPAC light, and um, uh, the the problem with that is and with with POSPAC uh, UAV, uh, you're you're post processing the UAV data, but you're not able to do real time, uh, you're not able to do real time processing in uh, in, uh, in POSPAC UAV. So POSPAC UAV is again limited to the data that's produced from the APX product line. You cannot post process in POSPAC UAV a POS system or an AP system. You would have to jump up to POSPAC MMS from there. Um. Here's an interesting question. Not sure if you can answer this. Is there any development within Aplanix to use the LIDAR to inform positional accuracy of the trajectory solution? Um, yeah, we, we have some LIDAR Q, QC tools built into uh, to POSPAC that we are testing right now. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the conversation about it. As you said, Mike, I'm probably not the guy to answer that question, but we can take that we can take that question offline and I can certainly get it answered by our, our product manager if we can if we can uh, record who asked and and, uh, and I'll make sure and get back to them. Um, another question, Trimble RTX makes solutions available immediately without waiting for precise ephemeris. How does it do that? Again, wrong guy to ask, but I will take that I'll, uh, I'll take that information back to our product management team to uh, to get an answer out. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll we'll capture all these questions and then we'll yeah. respond to the individual um, uh, uh, requesters. And one last question um, yes. as we're just closing this out: Are cloud-based processing options available to our customers? Yeah. So one of the things uh, we did uh, quite recently is we launched POSPAC uh, now, which is now available on the cloud, uh, and it's and it's transaction subscription-based processing. Uh, so what what Aplanix provides is the API uh, to to develop the relevant user interface credentials to access the uh, the cloud platform, and then from there the ability to track runs usage and create manage uh, end user accounts. Um, it's a great option to the perpetual licensing that we have right now. Um, of course, the limitation there is you have to be internet connected, but yes, we do have the POSPAC on the cloud now. Excellent. Eric, listen, thank you very much for uh, supporting me in this presentation. Uh, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has as well. Uh, we'll be publishing the webinar in the upcoming weeks, so we'll make sure that everyone has access uh, to the release. 
And uh, I just want to wish everybody a great day and thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Mike. And thanks to everyone out there. Greatly appreciate the time you've spent online today.